morning, troopers. Actually, this wasn't planned initially, but uh, due to, say, popul popular requests. There were many guys like showing up, uh, can you play that video again, uh, or I missed it yesterday. That's why we decided to do it, and I think it was a good way. Getting into the day, next to those who got into the day by participating in the run, uh, not many of them are here. I see some faces. Some are still in the woods, kind of. <laughs> but uh, the run was great. Packet Wars was great, as from what I heard. Troopers was great so far. I'm a happy man. And I'm very happy that we can get into the second day with my old friend, Sergei Bratis. There's two guys who have been contributing in the sense of a talk or a keynote to each individual edition of Trooper since the, since the first one. That is Rodrigo. Uh, Rodrigo, are you already here? Uh, that is, uh, I, I would have been surprised, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, still, we, yeah, we shouldn't make jokes. And, 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 and Did you do the run? What's that? Did he do the run? No, ah. he didn't. But uh, there was, a, there was a, a number of speakers there. I was really impressed. And uh, of course, I was impressed with everybody else, too. Uh, there were guys really struggling. And, but everybody reached the top. So that was good. Sagi Bratos. Uh, yeah, Sagi. <laughs> <laughs> There is one thing. I'm so overwhelmed uh, from the like, emotion and uh, bringing Sergey on stage. Uh, look at this. This is a uh, brand new iPad with uh, Troopers engraving. You can win this. That's uh, the, the price of the, of the challengers. Collect the token, put them in, get lottery tickets. Those lottery tickets will be put in the bowl. Uh, there will be, uh, how do you call this, a Glücksfee? Uh, picking those, and you can win this. So participate in the challenges. Thanks for your attention. And now, Sergei, <laughs> stage, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. It's great to be here. I absolutely love this uh, place, and I absolutely love this audience. So um, thank you for having me. Uh, my somewhat disorganized keynote is going to be called My Favorite Things. I was thinking of uh, a better title, but you know, here we're stuck with this one. And favorite things come in all shapes and sizes. You know, raindrops on roses, whiskers on kittens. Uh, arranged in their relative importance for the internet. Uh, sometimes things with tentacles, zombies, uh, shoggoths, uh, night guns, that sort of thing. And I just could not resist uh, another uh, picture of that kind. Well, my favorite things, uh, as you might know, are weird. Not, just as, not, not as weird as uh, what you saw in the previous slides, uh, but they're weird and impossible. So, you have those impossible problems, uh, laws of nature, things that, you can't, uh, think you, things that you can't strive against, things that you should learn to work around, the halting problem, and uh, even more undecidable things, well, no, there is only one undecidability, that is connected with two things, two programs, two computational systems, seeing a different thing. Uh, th seeing different things when you show them uh, this one uh, uh, message stream uh, packet uh, exploit. So I'd rather write programs that run on programs than actually run programs. And of course, we all know and love this as exploits. And the reason why we have so many, the reason why things are still broken and uh, will remain broken for years to come, is actually a hard uh, mathematical fact uh, that some things are simply not computable. So let's get into the diff between the first day's keynote and the second day's keynote. First, uh, the, fir uh, the first one was about things that are hard. This one is more about things that are provably impossible. And the difference be between the hard and impossible is just the same thing as between, say, flight or bioengineering to the 21st century, and things like perpetual motion. So flight is worth struggling for. Uh, perpetual motion is not worth inventing, is not worth trying to invent. Hard will get figured out. Impossible will just keep failing. 
And so when you're doing something over and over again and nothing good comes out, the uh, question is, maybe this is impossible, not hard. And then the second thing is uh, complexity. Well, complexity is hard and sometimes impossible. But the thing about complexity, it's not all created evil. Uh, take an airplane. It's devilishly complex. Yet we trust ourselves to them, and they don't do, don't do that badly as technology goes. On the other hand, again, on the other hand, again, some things are just played not there. So this landscape, complexity landscape, has cliffs and abysses. And uh, when you are building something, it pays to steer clear of those shear drops. So we must know and avoid them. And we haven't been so far. And the last difference is that um, uh, Haroon deplored that people are leaving for offense. I tend to cheer on that because offense is what drives science. The coevolution of offense and defense got us the understanding of why things are insecure. It will continue to do so. Uh, John Lambert uh, said that defense is offense's child. Another great saying, which I cannot attribute at the time, uh, a theory of security comes from a theory of insecurity. Again, we must understand what is uh, going on in order to um, uh, secure it. We must understand that computation that happens on the dark side. So we are suffering from a failure of language, from a failure of communication. Our exploits are just simply proofs by construction that certain unexpected computation exists. In traditional science, what we call zero day is just called a paper, a new result worth publishing. All science is uh, zero day. It's the search for things that we don't know yet. So somehow people don't talk about regulating science papers but they want to regulate zero day, and we'll come to that. With that, welcome to the dark side, right? This is how you learn about software, and then this is how you find out it actually works, right? And uh, again, there is a reason why the world uh, looks that way. And that reason is natural law. Uh, perpetual motion. Uh, we know two kinds, or rather we know that two kinds don't exist. You know, you can't get free work without energy, and uh, you can't transform energy without losses. Otherwise, both of those machines uh, would work. And then there is a, an impossibility in every area of physics wherever you look. Uh, speed of light, it's very hard to transcend, transcend that. Uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle at the quantum scale, and so on. Uh, no matter how hard you try, you will not get a solution to those problems. Engineers, physical world engineers, have been aware of this since forever. Engineering is actually defined by knowing physical impossibilities, like there is no lossless energy conversion. Energy conversion is hard. Uh, engineers know that um, uh, energy preserves, is preserved, momentum is preserved, and they work around that. That's why those planes fly. So impossibility doesn't mean that this is impossible, but uh, you should never attempt that which won't ever work in nature. Know the limiting laws and never base your design on the hope of cheating them. This is how an engineer works. And how do we work, right? A mechanical engineer knows what uh, his impossibility is, uh, that would be conservation laws. A thermal engineer goes by thermodynamics laws. A computer engineer knows about energy dissipation and latency being limited and the quantum effects as you shrink the size. And then you ask a software engineer, what is your impossibility? What should I not attempt or sh what should I not build on? And you might get something about certain crypto problems being hard. This is a problem. We live in a world of illusion that everything is possible in symbolic manipulation. This is just not so. Most of our designs, uh, however they work, and they work kind of like uh, those engines, really, um, they are based on things that just can't. 
So it took humanity quite a bit of time from the people who first saw that certain things are impossible, such as Leonardo da Vinci, or ye seekers after perpetual motion, cease and desist, uh, to people um, getting to build those things in their garages and then wondering why they don't work again. So it was quite a bit of time, right? Knowing what not to expect too much of is a really important point for an engineer. It is up to scientists to inform that that way. So cyber, the whole point of, uh, you know, the whole uh, point of cybernetics uh, was formulated by Norbert Wiener in 1964 when mathematical modeling was supposed to rule the world and was supposed to uh, pro produce uh, answers to all kinds of hard problems. Back then, he said, one of the chief duties of the mathematician in acting as an advisor to scientists is to discourage them from expecting too much from mathematics. Now think about that. This was the time when we believed AI would become commonplace by now. Well, we sort of believed uh, uh, on the other side of the wall, we sort of believed that we would have communism by year 2000 uh, uh, or uh, even 1980. Instead, as they joke, uh, they got the, we got the Olympics. Uh, so uh, the world was really a different place back then in terms of expectations. And there was a flaw in it. And this flaw is with us till this time. You have the political belief uh, acting out, being acted out even now that computers can improve everything and anything. Because they're just manipulating symbols. And symbols are easy to manipulate. You know, we sprinkle computer magic dust on our power grid, we'll get the smart grid. We'll sprinkle it on uh, something medical, we get the electronic health records and remote medicine and things like that. Uh, again, do these people stop and think, what is the impossibility here? What are the physical limits that we should work against? Uh, no, they do not. So. Symbols can be uh, manipulated at deceptively low cost on small scale. On larger scale, impossibility strikes. Physics does not suddenly break down on this level of human activity. This is 1979, uh, one of the most insightful papers about computer science, uh, which exists only as a technical report. And I will give you uh, a link uh, in my slides. Uh, so that you could read the uh, thing in, uh, in its entirety. So I propose that uh, the law of cyber-cyber, uh, stolen from Norbert Wiener, is one of the chief duties of a computer scientist in acting as an advisor to everyone, really, because everyone is depending on those devices, on those computations these days, is to discourage them from expecting too much from computers. And while we are at it, uh, let's make it a hacker. So a stolen from number tweener, uh, you saw it here. This is the uh, main professional responsibility of ours, I posit. And so what is it that's really uh, hard? Not just hard, but impossible. That's analysis, automated analysis of programs, right? We know, and this is a mathematical result, due to the likes of Church and Turing, that programs are really bad at analyzing programs. And any exploiter knows that all inputs are programs. In fact, you feed this program any input whatsoever, and it changes state, and it performs some computation. Your input is really the program. Your program is really the processor. Everything is an interpreter. It follows that programs are bad at analyzing inputs. And so we must know just how bad they are and avoid uh, those cases when uh, we strike impossibility. Of course, uh, the uh, most uh, well-known formulation of this impossibility is the halting problem. Since I come from the college where Dr. Seuss uh, went to school, uh, I can treat you to the uh, uh, sketch of the proof, right? Uh, no general procedure for bug checks will do. No general procedure 
for verifying if a program holds or does anything non-trivial, known as the Rice's theorem, uh, will do. Now I won't just assert it, I'll prove it to you. Well, I won't, I'll just sketch it. I'll prove that although you might work till you drop, you cannot tell if a computation will stop. Uh, stopping is a non-trivial property. There are many others. So basically, uh, the halting problem is uh, proven this way. Uh, this is the your dog um, proof. I heard you had a program for analyzing programs. So I put a program that analyzes programs into a program for you to analyze. This is how the proof sketch goes. Uh, you have, you assume that you do have such a program and uh, you feed it to itself and then you arrive at a contradiction. I won't bore you with the details, but this is really as much as uh, the proof, uh, as much of the proof as there is. Uh, apply this ostensibly existing program to itself and you will uh, get uh, an ad absurdum. So, you've heard this before, right? Uh, this is one of the paradoxes that are at the core of mathematics, at the core of the set theory, that we're resolving with tools like the type theory. If you like Haskell, uh, then uh, the, this is really one of the reasons, I promise you. Uh, I tried to do this, uh, to redo the uh, Bertrand Russell um, uh, paradox with a hacker, but hey, you know, can the hacker hack himself? Let's stop and think. So here is our most favorite uh, model of the general purpose computer. Uh, inputs versus programs, right? Uh, there is this endless tape which represents input. And uh, there is this state machine which you can think of as your processor that sits in between. And, you know, it reads and writes from the tape. This is the most powerful computing device. Uh, this is the most powerful computing model. Uh, your processors are essentially, in a sense, uh, equal to that. Of course, what, this is what we see in reality. We see angry bits and uh, destroyed uh, pig castles. But, again, this varies depending on the kinds of automata we have. So general purpose processors are, you know, they're kind of okay, right? Uh, we don't see a rata to processors every day. And finite automata are okay. So undecidability does not apply to them. You know, those birds are not really that angry. I mean, we write elevators every day, and your elevator is your typical finite automaton. And then, of course, we come to uh, general purpose programming. If you don't recognize this code, uh, I will uh, replay it uh, uh, shortly. And yeah, that's when we have uh, really, really angry birds. And in fact, uh, we are uh, completely screwed there. Uh, that code uh, was, by the way, uh, from the hard bleed. <laughs> it's a really angry bird there. Okay, so again, answering the uh, possible criticism of, of course, every bug, once it's been explained, is trivial. Hindsight is 2020. You know what else is 2020? Uh, perfect vision. Uh, you know, workplace safety rules are hindsight too. In Russian, we have this um, uh, saying that workplace safety rules are written in blood. For every case, uh, there is, for every rule, there is a really nasty uh, case or a course. So, such hindsight is really overdue in software. And so instead of you know, not checking voltage with our fingers, we should basically avoid solving the halting problem. We should avoid basing our designs on things that are impossible, not just hard. And of course, there are some others. And uh, you know, I really like those posters. Uh, you know, don't stack uh, your uh, bricks too high. Don't stand where people are using uh, underwear. People are using tools. Don't dig. Uh, under uh, <laughs> heavy chunks of stone, right? And of course we laugh. But then uh, we start to program. And when you need to work, right, 
you uh, cannot permanently exist in the state of paranoia. So there is somewhere a line after which you stop uh, uh, worrying about your inputs. And uh, then you can do dangerous things like malloc and memcopy and even arithmetic. All those things uh, that are known to somehow become the mechanism for exploits. Uh, this is the theory that you have validated inputs, you've recognized inputs as we uh, say, uh, I will clarify why, and then you're home free and you don't need to perform those checks all the time, because you can't, because there are just so many conditions in the logic of your program uh, that you can't tr keep track of them. So there has to be a point when you stop checking and rely on some, uh, on the results of that check, and they will catch you. In reality, it works kind of something like this. So there, are, there is input sanitization. Oh God, what an anti-pattern. You can't sanitize input, right? Uh, you can't recognize all the badness. This is impossible. Sanity checks. Again, there is no sanity in code. There is no sanity in computation. There is just what you specify. And then, of course, uh, yeah, this happens. And your malloc uh, is insufficient. And your mem copy overwrites your buffers. And your uh, integers overflow. And there emerges that uh, this uh, uh, Turing machine the weird machine on which your exploit runs and crashes everything. Okay. So, um, hard bleed, right? This is the simplest, yet uh, uh, a really disastrous uh, bug. And it was found in 2014, right? How could we have foretold how could we have said that something about this protocol is a gift that keeps on giving gifts like this? I posit that this is actually quite simple. Look at this syntax. There is this SSL3 record, and uh, it has a length. And inside that, there is another record, which also has a length. Now, this message, this packet, is only valid when these two links agree, right? And so what happens if they disagree? Well, hard bleed, right? Here is your packet coming in saying that the length of this record is four bytes long. Uh, and this record uh, says that its length, which is smaller than this one, is 65,000 bytes. Right? Which length would you go by when you are uh, running your code? And of course, uh, you um, have the um, uh, you believe this length, or so, uh, or so did SSL, and you export the sixty-five thousand bytes in your heartbeat, and there goes your private key. But there is a reason why this is happening, right? The first re uh, two reasons. The first reason is that uh, you have the same thing in your syntax twice. The second thing is that the code that parses this message looks like this. Does this look like a parser to you? Does this parser give you any clue as to what it is expecting for the correct input? Does this parser give you any clue when it should reject a message? Can you, how much can you really find out by this code? And the answer is none of this. This is why uh, this code will keep on giving. Syntactic complexity, even this trivial, tends to play those kind of games. If you don't uh, defend against that by having your code that processes this message, look like it really expects a valid uh, grammar here, uh, you will fail. And so you do. And uh, this, by the way, is the mem copy that gives uh, the private key away. So this is the patch. Does the patch solve the problem? So 
uh, yeah, let's get rid of this code. This is bad code. It's quite unclear what it does. Let's replace it with this code. Um, OK. So 1 plus 2 plus payload plus 16? What the hell are those things? <laughs> right? What is their relation to the grammar, to the uh, valid input that we should accept and act on confidently or uh, reject it and throw it out before we allocate any memory? Well, uh, this, is kind of, uh, this is kind of a little bit better. But still, you know, uh, what are all those uh, arbitrary constants in the code? It is not going to get, this is not a fix. It is not going to get better. Uh, it is just one of those things that you should be careful with, right? Uh, your, your code is a dangerous thing. So we come to this. Your input uh, is a language. You should treat it as such. You should write a spec, and most importantly, your parser code should read like that spec so that you would be able to see from the parser code exactly what is the valid uh, message that this code is expected to accept or reject. So uh, in, on this path, uh, not surprisingly, impossible problems lurk. Some languages are just too hard to recognize. So first, you should apply full recognition before processing. That means before you allocate memory, you should be sure that your message is valid. You can't be sure uh, if your message is valid unless that message is fully defined. So you know, um, say it with cats or say it with ASCII. This is actually not ASCII. This is Unicode. And this is Unicode by Melissa, a bad idea, who works for Veracode and writes novels and uh, pony winning songs um, when off the job. Uh, so there you go. You can put that principle in your code. It's, um, it's quite impossible uh, to not give privilege to the attacker to not give the computational privilege of extra space and extra transitions, which exploits are known uh, to exploit, are known to run uh, on. Uh, unless you really structure your code properly. If you don't, if you don't stick to the computational models uh, that we know work, then uh, your examples are going to be this trivial, right? This is the go to fail bug. It implements a state machine. We have an abstraction called the state machine. Our computation goes through a bunch of circles. Note that in that abstraction, that computation does not escape. It does not enter unexpected state. It does not drop shell. It does not become a, a, a weird machine. However, if you have a state machine, Treat it as such. You know, if you uh, generate your state machine by uh, cut and paste, well, one time you will paste one more uh, paste than necessary. Now, this is complexity. This is complexity at scale. You can't auto genuine, you can't automatically check this code because it bears no intent. It bears no evidence of the state machine that you expect it to conform to. And uh, predictably, it has to fail just once. These are the effects at scale. So just don't do that, right? Don't step on fish. I mean, it's this, it's this, it's this simple. Uh, and you might say, well, yeah, you know, so Apple screwed up, uh, everyone screwed, screws up, and uh, we don't like Apple anyway, maybe. Well, I kind of like mine. Um, uh, but hey, GNU TLS hello bug. Uh, this is the patch. Can you guess uh, what went wrong? Right? Misery loves company. When you see a patch like this, you know, your length if you're checking that your length is greater than, okay, right. It, 
is most likely a buffer overflow. So um, this is the root cause of it. Remember the SSL3 record? You have a record and a record inside and a record inside. And the uh, enclosure record has a length and the, the enclosed record has a length and this record has a length too. And guess what? It's only valid if all three lengths uh, add up. So, of course, this is what it takes, uh, this is what it takes uh, to uh, trigger this bug. You just get those lengths out of sync. Uh, don't do that. But uh, it's actually a little bit more complex than that. The syntax class of this uh, language of inputs, of a, la uh, of a language that nests objects uh, to uh, a, um, a presumably arbitrary depth, well, certainly here to the depth of three, is what we call the context-sensitive language. Context-sensitive language parsers are hard to verify. The reason why people uh, screw up on this is that this is a really hard problem. Eventually, it becomes impossible. We'll see exactly when. So you see the situation over and over again. This is a common failure pattern. Nested links are about data structure boundaries. They should be handled as syntax. They should be checked in the parser before you actually grant the attackers the uh, privilege of uh, memcopy and allocate and uh, integer operations that can overflow. So syntactically invalid messages just should not be allowed through. And it's your fault for choosing the syntax in the protocol that's hard to check. OK. So and you think, OK, well, you know, uh, again, another height, uh, another 2020, right? Or maybe the SSL stinks anyway. This is um, this old code base, and you have to keep compatibility. And sometimes it's easier to just start over, like with secure channel. Microsoft uh, re decides to uh, redo the secure transport. And this is new code. But there is one thing that unites it with the old code. It uses the same data format. It uses the same context-sensitive uh, nested lengths, uh, integers that must agree across the entire packet kind of syntax. And so this is the uh, trigger for that uh, vulnerability, right? You have an ASN1 encoding, type length value, several values uh, in the uh, certificate, in the client certificate, uh, that you rig up your SSL client to send to the server. And the trick is that you don't actually know from this encoding, from the input encoding, how much space you need. You need to compute it. Then you allocate memory for that. This is where uh, the problem uh, bites you because uh, you, uh, in this particular case, they allocated memory before they completely decoded the message. And the reason why it's hard, again, the reason why it's hard to catch and to test for that this is a context-sensitive grammar. Okay. Now, forget, uh, let's, let's go deeper into the land of crypto. Let's go berserk. Right? This is another 2014 uh, flaw found in uh, Mozilla's uh, NNS. And so, as you can imagine, a whole bunch of uh, software that relies on this library uh, is vulnerable. And this is a, a parser ambiguity in the ASN1, where have we heard this before, uh, encoded. Uh, signatures. So this gift will keep on giving, right? You have complex syntax, you have at some point an undecidable problem in testing the uh, parsers that 
uh, work with that syntax. Uh, which brings me uh, to uh, my favorite uh, case of uh, parser differentials. You have this, these two parsers, one message, and they see two different things. And to everyone in the uh, network intrusion detection, this is painfully familiar, painfully familiar. Since 1999, formatting your network streams so that the IDS sees one thing and then the target machine sees another is, uh, well, this is just the world of pain that we live in. Uh, this applies to X509 certs, the contents of SSL, uh, the Berserk and the secure channel uh, syntax as well. Well, the connection was made in 2010, and those, it turned out that those kinds of packet reorderings that trigger different reassembly uh, actually apply to common names in certificates. So imagine, uh, you should be familiar with this if you're running anything SSL related. Uh, there is a way to encode the certificate request so that the signing authority, the CA, sees one thing in the common name and the browser, the client, sees another. Uh, uh, Len Sassaman, Meredith Patterson, and Nan Kaminsky were looking for such cases. After they found 20 O'Day, this is clearly O'Day, because you can sign any Podang domain and then have it appear uh, to uh, your uh, users as your eBay or your Amazon. After they found 20, they got bored, right? Again, there is a reason for that. Uh, you have regular languages which are fixed with, uh, which have fixed with fields and can be parsed completely by regular expressions. You have the deterministic context free, which can nest objects to arbitrary uh, depths, but do not include things like uh, length fields. Then you have non-deterministic context free, which is where you get to most of the formats. I mean, this would be XML, this would be IPv4, except for um, uh, options, and you know how nice options are. I mean, if you run a firewall, you probably block them at the border. So there is a reason for that. If you have two automata that decide a language, checking if they accept the same language is impossible. No matter how much effort you put into the verification, no matter how much effort you put in testing, you will not succeed. Your unit testers will not succeed. Your automatic code analysis will not succeed. If the syntax of your language is beyond deterministic context free, ASN1 is way out there. In fact, there is this undecidability cliff, right? IPv4 without options is here, JSON is here, XML would be safe except for the entities and that's why we have quite a bit of XML uh, vulner parser vulnerabilities. IPv6 with its arbitrarily chained headers is over the cliff. You have to strive really hard to bring it back on the safe side and this is why you have to drop uh, I hear up to 40% of all packets at the border if you care about well-formed IPv6. X509 is way in the water, uh, together with the many tentacled things. Uh, PDF, which Adobe Acrobat actually rewrites, that is to say Adobe Acrobat is part of the machinery on which the exploit runs, and you don't know what machinery that machinery is because it changes version to version. Flash, and of course JavaScript. Well, it's Turing complete. What do you expect? You can't analyze those things. This is the halting problem. This is the Rice's theorem. No code on earth will be able to tell a good benign JavaScript from a non-benign JavaScript. 
And, oh, by the way, HTML5 plus cascading style sheets is Turing complete. Good luck analyzing that. And so basically, again, we get to this point when uh, checking whether two machines accept the same language, whether two nodes in your cloud that use different code bases will actually see the same message, whether your IDS and your target will see the same content. And so the IDS would be able to do something about it, at least before it hits the target. Uh, the moment you pick a language that's outside this safe pale, you lose. You're solving an impossible problem. You know who else subscribed to solving this impossible problem? Android, right? So uh, Android packages, well, uh, they come signed, right? And of course, uh, you don't want to roll your own crypto. So you take this wonderful crypto library written in Java that does your verification, and you, know, you just need to unzip it first, OK? And then if it verifies, then uh, you go install it. And your installer is in C++, because who would want to write in Java anyway? Right? Uh, it's just boring, mind-numbingly boring. And you know, you've checked it. So now you have a language that's quite context sensitive. Uh, look at your uh, unzip format. Uh, in, in fact, uh, look at your Poker GTFO. Uh, look at the article of Angel Bertini on the common formats and how to mistake those formats for each other, right? Uh, so again, uh, there is a reason for that. The reason is uh, the syntactic class of the uh, particular input language, specifically uh, zipping. Now, it just so happens that Java, uh, uh, that Java uh, crypto verifier sees a different thing than the C++ installer. Uh, C++ has unsigned integers. Java doesn't. You have different results uh, from your verification. You see a different package when you verify. Uh, you install a different package when you actually pass the verification. This is a hard problem. This is an impossible problem. It should not have been attempted because there is no automated way and no general solution to it. So they first tried to fix that uh, by uh, patching the parsers to remove those differences. They failed. They finally fixed it right. They used the same parser for both verification and installation. This is the only way. Any other way will fail. And you just should stop doing that, right? Uh, so think of how many instances of different parsers for complex syntaxes are in your uh, systems. Uh, it, it, they hurt. So uh, let's look at something uh, that's uh, slightly different. So here is your HTTP signed encoding, right? Here is your Apache uh, uh, CV2002, right? Um, uh, in 2002, this chunked encoding was found to be vulnerable. What is this chunked encoding? It eliminates the need for content, con uh, content length. So basically, you want to start sending your responses back before you know how long they are. You're traversing a database. So instead of send, uh, sending back one uh, single length, you send back a bunch of chunks, each preceded by a length, right? Simple enough. Well, not so simple, right? <clears throat> what if your uh, length is kind of big? And uh, since it's uh, hexadecimal, let's just say that it's also kind of beefy. So uh, this is a, a simple vulnerability that gets triggered uh, by uh, having a longer um, a payload than expected. This is the fix. Right? So uh, from the fix, you can see what the vulnerability was. 
So you see this buff size that is being converted to an unsigned int before the comparison, right? Uh, well, of course it was a signed int. And of course it overflowed and caused memory corruption. Simple enough, right? You know, this is really uh, 19th century construction technology. Uh, we know how to do those things. Or do we? It took 11 years to discover the exact same thing in Engine X. So, you know, when you see a patch like this, you know, what if the length is zero? Yeah, really, what, what, what then? <laughs> well, perhaps you should not continue processing. Okay? Uh, how did that fail? Your, um, your uh, Nginx is this enormous state machine. We like state machines. State machines are regular. State machines are the uh, kind of a computation that's easy to contain. Except this is the state machine that bites off one character and one character at a time. So by the time you go through all those clauses uh, and you determine which kind of a grammatical term you're in, it's easy to forget this. Uh, Nginx HTTP uh, parse it has 57 switch statements with 272 single care clauses and over uh, 2,300 uh, lines of code. Understanding which state you're in, understanding from this what grammar you are expecting, is unintelligible. That's why it took 11 years on a high value target with everyone knowing what kind of a problem chunk encoding had. So not so easy. You should have written, it should have been written in a style that makes it clear, and for the first time I'm naming it, the parser combinator style, what is it that your parser is expecting? Uh, finite machines that look like this will not save you. Ah, uh, well, for desserts, right? If you take your input and uh, pass it to something that's called parse and execute, you know you have a problem. But what's the real problem? Can you specify the grammar of your shell input? Turned out people could not even specify the channels and left one of them, environment strings, uh, completely alone without any kind of checks. So computational power exposed to external inputs is power given to attacker. Uh, you're just giving it away. And it does not matter how that happens, it will happen eventually. Like bash is a really bad thing to have anywhere near your inputs. And then of course, you know, bash is really a local app that woke up one morning on the uh, worship CGI bin with a pounding headache away from the shore, impressed into the service. So here is your uh, appropriate maritime um, uh, uh, safety poster. Uh, this is actually fish. <laughs> so, and I don't even know how to translate the name of that poll, but basically beware of it. <laughs> so, I hope I have convinced you that parsers are hard. You should not roll your own. Just like crypto became a lot better when people understood that non-trivial computations were involved, that were hard to foresee, hard mathematics were in, was involved, so with parsers. Parsers have not just hard, but impossible problems associated with them. Some constructs cannot be parsed properly. Some programs cannot be decided on whether they conform uh, to proper um, uh, properties or not. So use a parser construction kit. Uh, we are, um, Meredith Patterson, uh, my co-author, and a bunch of other really bright folks, much brighter folks than myself, and much better programmers, are working on this kit called Hammer, a parser construction kit. And 
uh, we, are, uh, we hope to eventually release the reference implementations of parsers uh, for standard protocols called tongs, uh, culminating in a secure parser construction kit. Let me give you a taste of that. So we start with the principle that the input, inputs are a language. Uh, they need to be properly uh, accepted or rejected before you do anything that is computationally powerful. So Postel's principle is pure mischief. You can't be liberal about what you accept if you care about your users. You have to be definite about what you accept. And yeah, be conservative in what you send, of course. Uh, the user of the first Unix and the inventor of Unix pipes and manager of Kernigan and Ritchie uh, at, at one point, um, uh, Doug McIlroy, uh, he is uh, uh, an emeritus professor at Dartmouth. And when we came to him, he said, I always thought that Postel's principle was pure mischief. These are the foundations on which we build our internet. This is why our internet is as trustworthy as it is. So you have to give a lot more attention to how you program your parsers. You have to be definite about that. Your parser should resemble the grammar, and you should have the grammar. Uh, that is if you hand code it. Uh, it's much better if you auto-generate it. So you have to have a bright line between the processing and the recognition. And you can isolate this by OS means. Or you can isolate this by means of verifying this code. You are not going to verify the majority of your code. This is a, uh, a futile hope. It won't scale. Uh, again, the halting problem looms in this space. But you should limit the computational power of your parser. You should have a grammar spec that's not too hard, deterministic, context-free. Uh, do not play in endlessly um, encapsulated payloads. And only then you can safely expose your computational power. Your, once you have the definition of your language, in uh, hierarchically, down to the smallest elements of your syntax, be they integers, be they dividers, be they single characters, be they words, you should build your parser up as the grammar that it is expected to parse. This is called the parser combinator style. This is how you can write a parser combinator in Hammer. Uh, there are other uh, languages uh, like Haskell, but Hammer is in C because it's kind of hard to find industry programmers who do Haskell. So you have a single parser for this constant token. You have a parser for an integer range. You have a parser for 8-bit and 16-bit integers. And you combine them. You uh, build up your grammar from those elements. This is the entirety of your parser. This parser is possible to audit. If you choose a language that's too rich, like BER, or too ambiguous, when you have so many ways, like five or seven, to encode an integer or a string, you are going to have a berserk. And you are going to have SSL certificate that parse, that parse differently. So use the DER, definitive encoding, instead. If you have BER, things will go bad for you again and again with SSL. This is not the bystander's view of the battle. This is the fundamental principle on which some complexity is just too bad to have. Look at the CVE counts. Uh, these are the CVEs for XML. And notice how many of them are due to uh, external entities that break the simplicity of the syntax. This is how many there are for JSON. JSON is strictly uh, context-free which is why JSON doesn't seem to have the problem that XML uh, seems to have. 
So when you undertake an audit of your code, ask your programmers, where is your recognizer? Where is the grammar for your language? Can you tell from this piece of code which language you are expecting? And then uh, if you don't need recursive nesting, that pushes you over into of the complexity cliff, especially with uh, non-deterministic grammars, don't. Just keep it regular. Keep it fixed width. Uh, whatever advantage you think you gain when you extend uh, your system, possibly, is going to be eaten up by the costs of upkeep and the security costs. So cross-object dependency is just pure poison. And by the way, protocols like uh, those that keep up your lights, DNP3, for example, one parser that we are trying to rework, they have cross object dependencies across layers. Uh, this is bad news for the so-called smart grid. So, you know, there are proofs, right? You can prove programs. Uh, uh, in uh, 1969, uh, C.A.R. Hoare uh, originated the art and science of actually proving programs correct. Right? This is the seminal paper on this, the axiomatic basis for computer programming. And this uh, was proving uh, the correctness of programs, verifying programs, was supposed to deliver reliability, documentation, and compatibility. Did it? So, but uh, the principle is solid, you know? You have the preconditions, you have the code, and once this code has been applied, you have the post conditions. And this post condition is assured if your program is proved. Then you can chain them along, right? P uh, goes through the code, gives you S. S goes through the code, uh, gives you R. And you just keep composing them. And, uh, uh, and then strange things happen. So here is your precondition. Here is your proven code. What if is co this code that is proven correct gets a different input that's not P. How much will it compute? How much extra power will be there? I mean, think of this code as your processing code. Think of whatever uh, is here is your parser. If you pass in something that is not fully recognized, you're going to get all of that. And the standard methodology for uh, proofs does not include any way of reasoning about what will happen if the preconditions do not hold. So uh, you cannot just uh, trust your approved uh, programs. And of course, a composition is uh, a tough mistress because you, know, you have your uh, theorems, and then you have your instructions, and then you're an arm. And there is thumb and then there is thumb two. Then there are several assembly languages, and you can read the code every which way. And by the way, on x86, you might even land at, uh, with inside an instruction and make your own program out of the pieces of instructions uh, so read. So uh, of course, this is harder in practice than it is in theory. But of course, some people have proven uh, x86 and have constructed uh, the x86 proved assembly in Coq, which is uh, a theorem prover. But all the time, we do a different kind of theorem proving. We do exploitation. Uh, we understand that an exploit is a proof by construction, that the code can do something else other than expected. Uh, the academia is kind of catching up. So there is this effort in automatic exploit generation. And yes, it can generate only 1990s kind of exploits so far. You know, buffer overflows uh, without ASLR, without DEP. But the most important outcome of that project is that it's that exploitation is actually a kind of verification task. It's a task where you construct proofs. It's a task 
where you search execution paths uh, to determine if a certain property holds, right? So all the time, we have been doing math. All the time, exploring the fallout of trying to solve the impossible problems of vendors claiming that they solve the halting problem. We have been doing practical exploit exploration of what Church and Turing exploit, explored theoretically. The limits, the boundaries of computation. And now we have a problem. Or do we have a problem? Uh, there is this uh, arrangement, uh, an arms control treaty, that went into effect in December 2013. And if you read it, you will see that it defines this kind of software that they call intrusion software in their wisdom. And what is intrusion software? It is defined as something that, as something that modifies standard execution path of a program. Can you think of something that does that? Modifies the standard execution path of a program in order to allow the execution of externally provided instructions. It's a debugger, exactly. Uh, can you think of uh, something else that modifies the standard execution path of a program? Uh, an exploit, yes, but uh, let's not uh, let, let's let, let, let's stick to the things that we use every day. Uh, wrong audience, right? Tough joke. Dynamic linker. Dynamic patching, right? So Vasanar, in its wisdom, uh, protects debuggers, excludes debuggers explicitly. It also excludes the uh, reverse engineering tools. So those are not arms. But you know what arms are? Arms are means of generating, developing, and operating intrusion software. Your father is a weapon. Your, um, uh, your compiler, uh, your uh, uh, you know, rope gadget finder, all of those are now controlled items. Actually, your inputs. I mean, the very, hold, uh, the very point of an input is for the machine to do something different on it, right? Inputs are regulated arms. Uh, any string you type, if it has an unexpected effect. Uh, they tried to give a very general definition. They succeeded. They outlawed inputs, <laughs> right? So uh, there is more about this in our talk with uh, Felix Lindner FX at the Usenix Security Symposium. The, uh, you can find this uh, online uh, on the Usenix site. But we have a problem. You know, you're not just mathematicians. You're arms dealers if exploits come from you. Or, in particular, if any automation of inputs come from you. So we have the citizen science in which most of the effective countermeasures came from the core evolution of people exploring the bounds of what is computable and demonstrating again and again that uh, the measures to contain the computation have been ineffective, that things that were not thought to be computable, were trusted not to be computable, were. And this is the same exploration that uh, Turing and Church were uh, engaged in, as I already said. Uh, this is something very fundamental to computer science. This is where the laws and the impossibilities, the natural limits on this realm of human activity lie. And we're going to have this citizen science seriously undermined unless we can persuade the regulators that uh, an exploit is really just a theorem, that zero day means a new scientific fact, that science, in fact, is pursuit of O day in every uh, walk of human activity, physics, chemistry, biology, uh, computing. Yeah, well, you know, enjoy your uh, uh, prison term or something, <laughs> right? 
And so recommendations. Uh, steer clear of uh, impossibilities. Simplify your inputs. Your parsers should be uh, resembling the grammar that they, expect to, uh, that they expect to accept. Keep the language as soon as, as simple as possible. Keep it irregular or context free, or just stick to simple rules like variable length fields should be avoided if you can. Nesting, recursion, should be avoided as you can. Nested lengths that must agree across a message should be avoided uh, whenever you can. So, uh, because all of those things require harder computational uh, power, and you are giving that power to attacker if you employ it at communication boundary. So, really, the only way forward uh, on complexity is the uh, core design of data formats. Now, it's too late for uh, a word or PDF. Uh, with IPv4 and IPv6, we will see convergence to a simpler subset, to a simpler sublanguage. The way IPv4 converged to a simpler sublanguage, uh, the same will have to happen with IPv6. But going forward and building future control protocols, vehicle control protocols, uh, it will have to be the core design of code and data. And, uh, I mean, if you're interested in how these things work, we, uh, we are going to skip through this because I haven't, <laughs> right? Uh, otherwise, we're going to uh, start seeing more and more of those weaknesses. Uh, let me direct you to this uh, common weakness enumeration, which uh, finally uh, tries to go beyond the CVEs and enumerate principles. Uh, of how you get weaknesses. And so uh, most of those weaknesses, if you look, are failures of recognition. You lose the security game when you design your format. Uh, and here is uh, a workshop uh, for the second year uh, going uh, that we uh, are trying to explore those topics at. So if you find yourself uh, uh, around San Jose, on uh, May 21st, uh, please join the language conspiracy. I think I'm five minutes over time. <laughs>